Hiya and welcome back to the Chemistry Academy. In this video we are going to be looking at proteins. Proteins are very similar to esters, fats and oils in terms of how they react because all of those molecules are made by condensation reactions and broken down by hydrolysis reactions. So that's really useful to think about when you're approaching using your knowledge of chemistry questions because if there's any water anywhere, then if you've got proteins, esters, fats or oils, they're all going to get broken down by hydrolysis. Um, the functional group in a protein is quite similar to an ester link, um, but it's got a different element in it, which is nitrogen. So proteins contain nitrogen and you can usually identify them by them having carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen elements in them. But we are going to have a closer look at what they actually look like. So, proteins are polymers and sometimes they'll be called peptides as well. Um, peptides are just like shorter chains of proteins. Um, but hopefully you'll remember from National 5, a polymer is a long chain molecule where it's made up, lots of, made up of lots of small units joined together. So the protein or the peptide is the polymer. The amino acid is then the monomer, so the small unit that makes up the protein. So we have an amino acid here. It's got two functional groups on it. It's got a carboxyl on one side and then it's got an amine or it can also be called an amino group on the other side. This R group here, that can be anything. It just depends on what amino acid you have. So sometimes it's just a hydrogen, sometimes it's a CH3, sometimes it's one of those weird bolt things. Um, but don't really worry too much about the R group. You only ever really need to copy them down. So that's our amino acid and that's the two functional groups. And essentially what happens is these functional groups react with each other on other amino acids and form a long chain called a protein or a peptide. Before we go on to actually looking at what the peptides slash proteins actually look like, um, just one more thing on the amino acids. So you get what we call essential amino acids and they're amino acids that your body can't make. So you have to obtain them through your diet. So we obviously need protein for our muscle, for our tissue, for hormones, um, all lots of things in our body, our hair. Um, and without having a supply of amino acids in your body, you can't make any of these proteins. Now, there are some amino acids that your body can produce from other amino acids if it needs them, but the essential amino acids are the ones that your body can't make. So you need to get them in your diet. Okay, um, so that's just a term that you need to try and remember because you will get asked about it quite a lot. Okay, so now we're going to look at how the amino acids actually join together to make the peptide or protein chain. So I've got three amino acids here and the R group this time, instead of writing the R, I've just drawn them as wee blocks. Um, I will show you some examples where there are actually um, atoms down here, but we'll just stick with the blocks just now to make it a bit more simple. So we've got the functional groups. Now the carboxyl group always reacts with the amine group. So what happens is the OH, just like when you're making esters, the OH comes off the carboxyl, hydrogen comes off an amine group, and that's where we get our water being produced in the condensation reaction. The same thing would then happen between these two amino acids. So again, the hydroxyl comes off the carboxyl and a hydrogen comes off the amine. Okay, so that's where we lose our water molecules. So then just like with the esters, if the water is being removed, then what happens is this carbon joins up with this nitrogen. And then this carbon joins up with that nitrogen and it just creates a long chain. So if I just draw what would be formed, so start from this side, we've got the NC with an H and then the square, and if you're drawing a peptide chain in an exam from some given amino acids, this is all you really need to do. It's just copy from left to right um, as you see the atoms. So that's what we've got. And then this carbon we now know is bonded to that nitrogen, which has got hydrogen on it. And then you just keep going along, copying down what's there. And then there's another C double bond O, and then that carbon's going on to this nitrogen now. And then that's on a carbon with a hydrogen on one of the wee squares again. And then that carboxyl group at the end does not react with anything. Okay, so this is a peptide chain. 
and it's specifically a tripeptide because it's been made from a from three amino acids. Okay, quite often you'll see in the paper them talking about a dipeptide, that's just where you've got two amino acids joined together. Okay, so it follows the same sort of prefixes. If it's anything above three, it tends to be called a polypeptide, but sometimes you might get some problem solving questions where they've told you specifically what type of peptide it is, like a pentapeptide, that would have five amino acids in it. Okay, so that's our tripeptide chain. What we're going to do now is look at some protein sections and look at what the hydrolysis of those would end up producing. Okay, so here we've got another tripeptide chain and in this case I've actually added on some actual R groups so we're not just dealing with the letter R or blocks anymore. Now, I forgot to mention before, the bond that's formed when you make a peptide or a protein is known as an amide or a peptide link, so you can call it either. And that's the functional group in a protein. So an amide or a peptide link. If it's in short and structural formula, it looks like CONH in the middle of some carbons. So that's something to look out for. And um, I often call it, although it's not in the right order, the CHON group. So if you were to go like diagonal like that, spelled out CHON. Um, so anytime you see a CHON in a molecule, that means it's a protein or a peptide. Okay, I just like to make up silly things to remember stuff. Um, so that's the amide or peptide like you can call it either. Don't get confused with the amine. So this is an amine where it's just got nitrogen. The amide has got a carbon and oxygen as well. Um, and that's got a D. So just try to remember amine with an N is where it's just nitrogen and hydrogen. Whereas the amide is where you've got the carbon double bond with the oxygen and the NH. So that's our amide peptide links. If we're going to hydrolyze the peptide, it's those links that get broken. Now, one thing that they do refer to in the exams is partial hydrolysis. So if it's partial hydrolysis, that means you're only going to break one of the amide links you've got. Oops, can't spell. And quite often you'll be asked to identify what dipeptide would be produced when you partially hydrolyze it. So in that instance, we're looking for which two amino acids would still be attached to each other. So if we just break this amide link first, so a bit like when we hydrolyze an ester link, you just break it through the middle. So that's where it would break. So we would end up getting this as one of the fragments. So if I just copy this out as it's written, don't need to change anything about it. And then that's where it's been split. So that's one part. And then this is the other section that we've produced. So the N, the H, CH, and again, this bolt thing, don't let it confuse you. You just need to copy it down as it's shown. It's just a ring of carbon and hydrogens. And then this bit's all still stuck together because we've not hydrolyzed that because we're only doing a partial hydrolysis. And that's what I forgot to do. Okay, now to finish this off, we just need to add in the water molecule that's been used to hydrolyze it. So the double bonded oxygen to carbon side gets an OH and then the nitrogen gets us the H. So this would be an amino acid because it's got the two full amine and carboxyl groups. It's just the one single unit. This would be your dipeptide because that's got two amino acids still joined. Okay, if you were asked um, to find a dipeptide that's formed during a partial hydrolysis, you'd be looking for this fragment. If that wasn't one of the options, then you would break this group instead and you'd be looking for this fraction with the OH on the end. The other thing to note about amino acids is because they've got two different functional groups, 
they're actually a bit like your right hand and your left hand. So if we were to switch the order of these around, it would give us a completely different peptide. It's not actually going to be a mirror image because you've got different functional groups on the end. So if we were to put these amino acids in a different order, it would give a completely different peptide because it is like your right and left hand. So my left hand, my right hand, if I was to swap them, that's not a mirror image because my thumbs are on the outside now, whereas they were on the inside before. So if you're asked to give a different dipeptide or tripeptide that could be formed, you just need to swap some of the amino acids around um, and then that'll give you a completely new structure. The other thing is that if you are hydrolyzing a peptide, you can only get amino acids stuck together if they were originally stuck together. So if you hydrolyze a protein and you're looking at a combination of dipeptides that have been produced, you can only get a dipeptide if those amino acids were originally next to each other in the chain. So what I mean by that is this could be a dipeptide, this could be a dipeptide, but you wouldn't get a dipeptide with this amino acid and this amino acid because they weren't next to each other in the first place. Okay, so quite often you're presented with like letters. So for example, um, just say you've got a, an amino acid chain that has like this letter combination. If you were to look at the dipeptides you could produce from that, you could get X and Y, you could get Y and W, you could get W and A, and you could get A and G. But that's the only options. You couldn't get G and W because they weren't next to each other to begin with. You couldn't get A and Y because again, they weren't next to each other in the peptide chain. And you couldn't get W and X either. So you hopefully get the idea. Okay, you can only get a dipeptide of that specific amino acid combination if the amino acids were to get next to each other in the peptide chain. So just the last couple bits on proteins. So the thing about proteins is when you heat them above 40 degrees, they become denatured. So I'm sure you've all probably heard that word before. So this is where they change shape irreversibly. So once you've denatured a protein, that's it. You can't get it back into the way it was before. And the reason for that is because when it's been denatured, the van der Waals forces that occur between those side chains, so those like the blocks I drew or the R's or um, the things that were coming off the bottom of the last peptide I had on the board, they are known as the side chains. They form van der Waals forces with each other that can cause the protein to like twist around or stay a bit straighter. And that essentially determines the shape the protein has. So when you heat it, those van der Waals forces break down and that's what causes the protein chain to unwind and change shape and you can't get it back. So that's what happens when it's being denatured. It's the van der Waals forces that are breaking between the side chains. So the amide links are still intact they are not hydrolyzed or anything, it's just the van der Waals forces between the side chains that get broken when you heat it. The other thing is enzymes. So if you're a biologist, you'll know all about these, but if you're not, they are proteins that act as biological catalysts. So that just means they catalyze reactions that take place in living things. Um, but the biological catalyst phrase is the one you want to remember. So their biological catalyst made from proteins and when an enzyme denatures, because they are proteins, they will also denature, they don't work as catalysts anymore. So although this is technically part of the rates topic, I like to talk about in the proteins because it's specific in this context, a rate graph for an enzyme controlled reaction will look like this. So the rate will increase as temperature increases until it gets to an optimum. Now that optimum temperature is different for each enzyme and so you could be asked to produce a graph uh, that shows where that optimum is but they'll tell you in the question what temperature the optimum occurs at so that's just where you would make the peak of your graph. So it'll increase up to the optimum temperature and then after that it takes a big steep drop off because then that's it becomes denatured so it doesn't work at all. So there's no like gradual decline it's just a sheer drop. Okay, so that's the sort of graph you'll get for an enzyme controlled reaction or a reaction that involves an enzyme. So that's essentially everything you need to know on proteins for the higher chemistry course. It does seem like a really short one, this one, but a lot of it is just drawing the amino acids that are broken down. Um, so just finding the amide links and drawing the squiggly line through them. Um, if you are asked a question about 
identifying how many amino acids are in a peptide chain, my advice would be to just draw a squiggly line between the amide links and then count how many separate sections you've got. So just remember, look for that chon arrangement and that's your amide link and then just draw the squiggly line through it. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the Chemistry Academy and we'll see you again soon.